the first book of Samuel, session number 26, and we continue with 1 Samuel chapter 14. We ended with verse 6 yesterday, where uh, Jonathan said to his um, loyal armor bearer, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, because it may be that Yahuwah will work with us, for there is no restraint for Yahuwah to save Israel by many or by few. And this is a key note verse that you need to underline in your, in your Bible. Because sometimes we do feel that we are so few in a community where the truth is upheld by few only. It is so um, lonely and it becomes so difficult and it is scary. And if you can try and put yourself in the shoes of Jonathan and this armor bearer, um, how they are going to stand up against this massive garrison of the Philistine army. Only these two guys. But they have their trust in Yahuwah. Not trusting in our own arm, not trusting in our own sword, not trusting in our own strength. But, but let's see. Come, let us go up over there to those uncircumcised heathen that think they can blaspheme God and God's um, holy nation that think they can stand up against this God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and destroy his people. Let's go up to them and let's see if God will not today save us by the hands of a few people. Narrow is the road and few are there that are upon it. Do not despair in your community, in your family, sometimes in your marriage. If if you're still in church, in your church community, it doesn't matter. Yeshua said, you are the salt of the earth. You are not the sugar. You are not going around to make everybody feel good. That's what the churches do best. Let they continue to do it. They make people feel, feel good. Like the Bible says, they will gather preachers for themselves that will tickle their ears. That they don't want to hear the the word of truth, the sword that divides between soul and spirit and bone and marrow. So be the salt, be the Jonathan, be the gift of Yahuwah, Yanatan, be the loyal armor bearer that says, following um, Jonathan like a loyal little dog, like a, like a loyal servant, wherever you go, I will follow you. Because I can see you trust in God. So I will trust in God. Let us also pray this prayer. Father, every single day of my life. Father, there is no restraint for you to save. You can save by many and you can save by few. There's no restraint for you to save my marriage. Even if I'm only the only one working in this marriage. There's no restraint for you to save my children. There's no restraint for you to save and to bring back to covenant all your lost sheep. Whether they are my family members or they are people that I know or people that I don't know. Although I'm few and sometimes although I'm alone, maybe you can still save somebody else through me. Through me, your loyal servant, who just wants to serve you and do my duty according to the thorns and according to the talents that you gave me and according to the burning of your word inside of me. Like the prophet, I think it was Jeremiah, said, I don't want to speak to these people. I'm too young. I'm too scared of them. Um, But I cannot help myself. Your word burns inside of me like a fire and I have to open my mouth and let the fire come out. Because God, on you, there's no restraint, there's no limit with which or with whom you can save. With me, there's a limit. I cannot save anybody. I can try and witness and I can live the life you gave me and I can live the truth and do all the right things and keep your commandments and and keep your holy days. Although there's only 20 people that keeps it with me and there's 2,000 people in church not keeping it, but keeping pagan feasts. But God, there's no restraint on you. 
So even by the few that we are, you can save. And if I read the Bible and I see the evidence and the examples all throughout Scripture, thinking back of Gideon and his 300 men who were like loyal dogs lapping at the water, then I know God, God saves through the few. Because why? If he had to use much power and great men and women who's got big platforms and big muscles and lots of money or whatever, then the salvation and the glory and the honor goes to those human beings. But now God wants to use the few people. He wants to use me and you and Jonathan and his armor bearer. And he wants to show his commitment to his people because in the end all the few on the narrow road when they finally come together the bible says it is a multitude that cannot even be counted and later on we will see that it's almost like the reward for for this courageous brave people that is willing to go and try to be a representation and a a diplomat for God's kingdom, how they are rewarded with honey. Jonathan ends up eating honey. The rest of the camp, including the king and, and the priests, they, they all go and sit under a tree. And then finally, in, in the next session, we will see how, how King Saul says, um, nobody can eat any, anything before you know we've completed our fight or battle or whatever um but but jonathan didn't know about that decree so he ate the honey so all the people sitting depressed and scared under the pomegranate tree you know the the king the um the rulers and and the the religious rulers and all the people that are sitting with him looking towards the leaders what are they going to do is the priest going to start praying towards Yahuwah? are we going to go into a fast and a prayer and seek his face we are looking at you religious leader but you're doing nothing we are looking at your king are you going to lead us on this battleground with with God being your strength and you trusting in him and you are encouraging us to trust in him and and even if we are only how many were they was it 600 um yeah 600 men um maybe God will save all of Israel through these 600 men only and maybe the Philistines can be 30,000 but but maybe God can save Israel through 600 men let us trust our God our God said we can go over the Jordan River and we can um, totally vanquish the giants and the Nephilim in the promised land. Even um, if we were only few and we were like grasshoppers next to them. But we are looking at our king and our priest. We are looking at our government and our religious leaders. We are looking at, at the people at the top or the, the big men that claims to know God. And they're doing nothing. They're sitting depressed quiet useless under the pomegranate tree and later on they are even um, um, restricted from from eating anything but these two guys Jonathan and the armor bearer willing to take up the little bit they do have willing to take the one talent God gave and go and make it something more not bury it under the pomegranate tree and leave it there um, because you're afraid they are rewarded with a sweet taste of honey we'll see in the next session the bible says jonathan's spirit was lifted his eyes got lightened when he tasted the honey so that is the reward even if you are few remember the bible says we will be an uncountable multitude of people from every corner of the earth gathering together with white clothes although they they were thorns on our head we will be dressed in the white clothes in the bozes and we will gather up for us the sweetness of the reconciliation that we as human beings will finally have with our beautiful god one day
when he finally destroys all the uncircumcised and he brings into his kingdom those who are loyal and faithful servants. Matthew 7 verse 13, um, verse 13 Enter you at the straight gate. Straight, that word straight is that pressed gate, the narrow gate, the difficult gate, not the easy road. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Easy is the way that leads to destruction and most will go on that road. Because straight is the gate, narrow and difficult and pressed is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life. But only a few are there that find it. Just because you are few or you are young, or you are alone, or you feel weak, don't let that stop you. The people said to, to small David, when David was still young, in 1 Samuel 17 verse 33, um, Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistines to fight with him, talking about Goliath, for you are but a youth, and this is a man of war from his youth. And I'm saying, I'm not, if I was David, I'm not able to go against him because I'm a youth. So what if I'm a youth? God has taught me that if I trust in him, I can even kill a bear and a lion in the field when I was looking after his sheep. David looking after the sheep in the field is such a representation of us also looking after the sheep of the flock. We, we cannot um, be selfish and love our own comfort and our own life more than the life of God's people. We have to be willing, like Jonathan, to go up against the, the huge mountain of this enemy system for the sake of the sheep of God. Like David was willing to go up against the lion and the bear. And here he was, he was willing, as a young man, to go up against this giant Goliath and he told the, um, the giant I come to you in the name of my God and just like with Jonathan the whole uh, camp was sitting under the pomegranate tree being depressed and here with David the whole camp was standing on the sideline on the hills being depressed and fearful and David going down the narrow road the difficult go, going through the difficult um, um, gate that sometimes that difficult choice you know that if you make this choice today you are choosing that gate you are choosing that road and that is not going to be the easy one so in the instant that you make that decision your destiny is absolutely spelled out in scripture isn't it a beautiful thing so what if David is just a young man, so what? Because if we are touched by God, if, if our spirit, if, if our passion is moved to stand up for this God that we say we worship and that we say we love so much, we cannot be afraid. Even if we are few, even if we are young, Yahuwah said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1 verse 7, he said to Jeremiah, do not use the excuse that you are a child, for you shall go to all that I shall send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Even if you have to go up to the, to the garrison of the uncircumcised, Jonathan, go and speak for the glory of Yahuwah. Be not afraid of their faces, God says to Jeremiah. Why? Because I am with you. I am there to deliver you. Then Yahuwah put forth his hand, and we know the right hand of God is Yeshua. And he touched my mouth, says little Jeremiah. And Yahuwah said unto me, Behold, what have I done now that I've touched your mouth? I have put my words in your mouth. I have put my words in your mouth. Jonathan, I, I'm putting my strength in you. David, I'm putting my courage in you. And whatever your name is that's listening to my voice today, God says, 
if I touched you and my word, the seed that was planted in you, have germinated and have grown and have started to become the olive tree of Romans 11, then be not afraid, even if you are few, because with Yahuwah there is no restraint to save by few or by many. And David learned this from a young age. He probably heard about the amazing thing that Jonathan did. And later on he did the same thing. And he learned this important truth that by many or by few, when God is with you, you, you can be many or you can be few. It doesn't matter. And he should have remembered this in 2 Samuel 24, where he decided to count how many soldiers he had. Because the moment he, he wanted to know what the strength of his army was, it was about saying, oh, I've got the numbers. And he forgot this important truth that God taught through the life of Jonathan. And before David sinned, he, he still remembered that truth. He, he even wrote it down. He made sure that it is preserved in the scriptures for us for always to read. Psalm 18 verse 29. For by you I can run through a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. For my God, his way is perfect. The word of my God is tried and tested. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. This is what we are learning from this beautiful son of the king, Jonathan. So making that difficult decision to go up to the garrison of the uncircumcised for the honor and glory of God and for the salvation of God's people. It is a burning bush experience. At the thorny bush you receive your thorns that you must now carry. But if you wear your crown of thorns well, what is the end result? It is putting on the fine white linen. The name of the one sharp rock was Boses. The name of the other sharp rock was Sinis. The one was on the north against Michmash and the other on the south against Gibeah. This burning bush, thorny crown, experience although it is difficult we are drinking the cup and we are storing up our talents and our sacrifices to our God and the end result will be with the innumerable multitude in white fine linen eating honey tasting the sweetness of the honey that is as the Bible says the words of God that drip out of the rock like honey. So as Jonathan, and now I'm talking about you and me, as we are squeezing through these sharp rocks on both sides, going up to our destiny where we are called, to, where God touched our mouths with His Word, and we are called to witness even to the uncircumcised, testifying that our God is God and you will not blaspheme Him. As we are squeezing through these rocks, the honey is dripping out of it. And you might not be tasting the honey while you are squeezing through the sharp rocks, but it is there and you will have your reward. As God said so clearly, Deuteronomy 32 is all about God's people that He is leading. Although they had to go through the wilderness, He made them to suck honey out of the rock. Because the rock is our salvation, Yeshua, which gives us the living waters in this wilderness, sharp rock, thorny bush journey in which we have to fulfill our destiny, make disciples of every nation and teach them everything that I've taught you to obey and stand up for my name and be counted as one of those who follow me wherever I go, even if it means through the wilderness, I will feed you with honey. And remember that, I think it was Jeremiah as well, who had to eat the scroll, and it was bitter in his mouth, but sweet as honey, because there is always first the Gethsemane experience, before there is the re resurrection. There's always the sacrifice of yourself, 
before there is the glorification when Yahuwah will say, Come in, my good and faithful servant. So let us taste the honey. Sometimes when you know um, you're very hungry, one o'clock is lunch, but now it's only like nine o'clock and you're so hungry. You've got so much work to do, but you can already taste the lunch that you're going to get at one o'clock. You know you're going to get lunch at one o'clock. Therefore, you've got the strength and the courage to endure all the hard labor you have to do now from nine o'clock all the way through to one o'clock because you know there'll be lunch. If you didn't know that there was going to be lunch, if there wasn't any money to buy food, then your, your work would have been difficult so much more. It, it, there would have been no passion. There, there would have been no end goal in sight. But now we have a hope in our Savior, Yeshua. We have a hope on the resurrection. We know there's going to be a resurrection. We know His kingdom is going to be restored. And we are going to be part of that if we remain on this journey. And we know that no matter how difficult this, um, um, this pathway to the garrison of the uncircumcised, this sharp rock that we have to overcome. Doesn't matter how difficult it is. We know on the other side there's going to be honey. We will be fed by the honey. Because even in this very same rock that is hurting us now, the honey comes from that rock. Deuteronomy says, God says in Deuteronomy, following Yeshua, wearing his thorn of crowns, Pulling in the same yoke as him. Yes, it is difficult. And he is the rock. The Bible says, um, the, uh, Yeshua is the cornerstone. And if the cornerstone falls upon you, he will crush you. But if you fall on the cornerstone, you will just be broken. And it is a broken and a contrite spirit that God can build up. And he can give the inheritance of the new earth too. So let us fall upon this rock. Let us squeeze through these sharp rocks, Boses and Sene. And let us serve this rock to the best of our ability. Even though the blood and the sweat and the, and the tears are dropping. Yeshua did it for us. Because out of this very same pain and, 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 and struggle and tribulation will come the honey of the sweet words of the Torah that fell from the lips of Yahuwah that will speak to us in the end day. Call us by our names out of the dark, deep valley of the shadow of death and um, lay before us the table in the face of our enemy and our cups will run over. Let us not forget the end result. So, um, back to 1 Samuel 14 verse 7. And the armor bearer said unto Jonathan, Do all that is in your heart. Turn you, behold, I am with you according to your heart. And remember, the armor bearer doesn't have a weapon, but he is carrying Jonathan's weapon. Because the comforter, as the the um, armor bearer said, Do what is in your heart. If we love Yahuwah with all our heart, if our hearts are circumcised, if the Torah is written on our hearts, then let us do what is in our hearts because the Comforter says, I am with you. I will carry your weapons. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto those men and we will discover ourselves unto them. So to discover yourself, to surprise Surprise! I'm here. Hello. So we will creep onto those guys over there through these rocks. And once we are a little bit closer, we will show ourselves to them. If they say unto us like this, Wait there until we come to you. Then we will stand still in our place and we will not go up unto them. But if they say like this, Come up unto us, then we will go up. For then we know that Yahuwah has delivered them into our hands. And this shall be a sign unto us. Okay, so, so either the uncircumcised Philistines can say, 
wait there until we come down to you and we'll come and show you a thing or two. Or they can say, come up here to us, or we will show you a thing or two. So they can either say one of those two things. So just like Gideon asked for a sign, just like the servant of Abraham, remember, he also asked for a sign. Here Jonathan is actually asking for a sign. He says, there's only these two things that they can say. And if they say the first thing, then we know we will stand still here and let them come down to us because maybe these sharp rocks will make them fall and they will, they will all be killed anyway. Or if they say we must go up, then we'll go up because this will be a sign from God. They could have said many other things. Hey, did you guys bring some Coke and chips? You know, they could have said anything else. But if they said one of these two things, it's a sign from God. So let us explore this a little bit further. And both of them discovered or showed themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Look at this. The Hebrews came forth out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. Remember in the previous session? 1 Samuel 13 verse um, 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, <laughs> hello, in a strait, in a, in a narrow, um, then the people hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews even went over the Jordan and, and hid away in the land of Gilead. So now the, the enemy of God and God's people are laughing Oh, lucka, you stupid Hebrews. Did you decide to come out of your hiding places, you scary little scary cats? And yet I want to answer, yes. Why? Why is Jonathan and his armor bearer, why are they showing themselves fearlessly to the enemy? Because they had a Boses and a Sene experience. They had an experience at the thorny bush. They had an experience to, to know what it is to wear the white clothes of God. They are willing to sacrifice themselves for God's people. And when you've got that experience and you, you know that afterwards you're going to taste honey, then nothing is going to stop us. I'm going to come out of my hiding place. I'm going to show myself to you. I'm not going to be scared. Just like Gideon and his 300 men. They were 10,000, remember. And then they were something like, what was it? 3,000 or something. And then finally God said, no, only 300. So like those 300 men, um, when, when we are passionate and we've, we've gone through an experience where we had a meeting with our God, then, then nothing can stop us. You can, there from the top of the hill, you can throw stones at us, you can laugh at us, you can scorn us, and you can um, feel victorious because, oh, all you believers are like a hiding in your caves now, aren't you? None of you are talking about all this evil beast system of the Antichrist that's starting to stand up. None of you are even opening your mouth against the whore of Babylon church system. That keeps on saying, like somebody yesterday said to me when I sent out the Shavuot camp invitation, he said to me, are you still keeping the feasts of the Jews? And I said, well, um, Yeshua also kept the feast of the Jews. And um, it's just funny because I see in the Bible that Paul also kept the feast of the Jews. And I see that all the disciples after Yeshua went up to heaven kept the feast of the Jews. No, they didn't. Show me the verse. So I send him a whole long list of verses proving that the feast days of Yahuwah was kept all throughout the New Testament. Even after Yeshua was resurrected from, from dying supposedly to end the law and then he just replied you will not convince me and I'm, I'm feeling so angry this morning and I'm feeling sad because my little dog died but this anger and this sadness I cried out to Yahuwah this morning and my thorny experience my time with God just reminds me like my little dog was so loyal 
like the, the 300 men with Gideon was so loyal. They were lapping the water. I need to be loyal. I need to wear the thorns that people throw in my direction. I need to wear it like a crown. And I need to be willing to go up against these uncircumcised people that wants to blaspheme God, blaspheme his Torah, blaspheme the holy chosen lost sheep that is supposed to be reunited with our older brother, the Jews. We have to be reunited with him. These church people don't even read their own freaking Bible. Romans 11 and Yeshua and and all the disciples talk about this non-stop. They need to start seeing the truth of scripture. But they choose to remain the uncircumcised heathen throwing rocks at us as we are squeezing through the sharp rocks and wearing our thorny crowns. Praying so that our knees are being um, scraped and the blood is flowing on our knees because we are praying for these people's salvation. May Yahuwah save them. There's no restraint, Yahuwah. You, you can save by many or by few. And if it's not through me, then may it be through somebody else that might witness to these people again. And they can, they can hear it by a second and a third witness. Let me take out the thorns of frustration and anger out of my heart. And let me wear those anger thorns like the crown Yeshua had to wear. And let me continue going up this narrow road to, to stand as a witness for the kingdom of God. Because these uncircumcised um, men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, we will show you a thing. <laughs> And this is the enemy. The enemy has the high ground. In this case, the Philistines had the high ground. Jonathan had to go up. He had to go through the rocky pathway, the narrow, rocky, sharp rock pathway to go up, to go fight against the enemy. And now in our lives, the horde of Babylon, she has the high ground. The beast has the high ground. Satan has the high ground. He even took Yeshua up onto the temple and showed him all the world, onto the highest mountain. And he showed them all the kingdoms and said, you know, just worship me and you can have all of this. They've got the high ground. But the truth is that when we, with a two-edged sword, like Yeshua did to Satan with a two-edged sword, the Torah, when we, with our sword and our armor bearer, continues up this rocky road, this narrow way, we will show them a thing or two. The Bible says clearly, Daniel 11 remains my favorite. In the end days, those who has understanding will do great works for the kingdom of God. They will bring many people to salvation and understanding and to the truth. But they will suffer in this journey that they follow. But their suffering and their persecution will only make them pure and white and give them righteousness. So we have to, Daniel 11, 1 Samuel 14, we have to go through that persecution whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, verbal, on social media, it doesn't matter. We go through the persecution. Read Daniel 11, read 1 Samuel 14, so that we can get the victory for God, even if we pay with our blood. doesn't matter, because we will be dressed in the white clothes, and we will taste the sweetness of the honey of seeing our God's face. And hearing his voice, not through people like me that is teaching the scriptures, but his own, own voice.